Hello friends, Megan Farner invited me to share a message with you uh, today for her conference for the Latter-day Disciples podcast. And she asked me to speak on the second coming. And I think that it's important for us to understand that there are many things pertaining to the second coming that we think that we understand, but we don't really understand. And indeed, what we don't understand about the second coming is a lot. And there's a quote by Brigham Young, and he said that we will be as ill prepared for the Lord's second coming as the Jews were for his first. And as I have studied about these things, I have become absolutely convinced that that is true. And there are all kinds of people out there that have written books and made extensive study, uh, put together all kinds of timelines about the events of the last days. But there are some fundamental components about the second coming and the events leading up to the second coming that comprise what the scriptures refer to as the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That unless you have really put in the time to study the specific resources that Jesus Christ pointed out and said, listen, study these things. If you haven't done that, then I guarantee you that whatever you have studied about the second coming, it's not enough. The Lord isn't interested and never has been interested in making things easy. Think about the first coming of Jesus Christ to the Jews. Hardly any of the Jews after Christ's death upon the cross continued in their belief that he was the Savior. And why was that? Well, because the things that he taught went against the grain. They weren't the same things that were being taught in the synagogue. Yes, in the synagogues, they were teaching about the God of Israel and that there would be a Messiah. And, you know, they were teaching about the covenants that God had made with the house of Israel and how to fulfill those covenants and keep them. They built hedges up around the law. They had come up with all kinds of interesting explanations for the doctrines and had many insights into different aspects of the law of Moses. But the, at the end of the day, hardly anyone actually understood the gospel for what it was intended to be. And it didn't have to be that way, but that's the way that it was. And Heavenly Father could have made it much easier for people to understand and accept his son. But he wasn't interested in doing that. He was interested in trying people's faith. Just look at the front runner, the forerunner, that he chose to prepare the way for the coming of his son, Jesus Christ. It was John the Baptist. John the Baptist compared to the structure amongst the, the Jewish religious elite, John was a total outlier. I mean, he was in the wilderness. He ate bugs for dinner. Uh, he was dressed in wild clothes. He was probably unkempt and you know looked like a wild man. In fact, they referred to him as a wild man. Why did God the Father select John the Baptist instead of Caiaphas, the high priest of Israel? If he had selected Caiaphas to announce the Messiahship of his son, how would things have been different? If the rabbis throughout Israel were on board with Caiaphas, you would have had a near universal conversion. But that's not what Heavenly Father did. 
Instead, he used a wild man to be the forerunner of his son. And then when his son came, the leadership of the church at that time were threatened by him. The, some of the you know, Pharisees and Sadducees, when they saw him, some of the priests, some, some rabbis saw him and they could see the literal fulfillment of the scriptures in the incredible works that Jesus Christ was doing. But it, it threatened their entire way of life. Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law of Moses. And changing from that was a total change of their way of life. I mean, they made a lot of money doing what they did, managing the affairs of the temple. What what would they be doing if, if they no longer were administering, administering uh, sacrifices and uh, being in charge of the laws and the ordinances under the law of Moses? So they weren't on board for the most part. And they offered all kinds of explanations that people needed to put aside all of the things that they had witnessed firsthand and all of the feelings that they had felt in their heart. They had to set those aside for the explanations that these men who had a vested interest in the outcome. And as a result, even though you know, all Jerusalem was in an uproar on Palm Sunday, when Christ came into Jerusalem for the last time, and they were there were shouts in the streets proclaiming him to be the Messiah. You know, he was forgotten or dismissed in fairly short order. Until, I mean, less than 2% of the Jewish nation would go on and become Christians. It was not easy to accept Jesus Christ. In order to accept Jesus Christ, you had to go against the beliefs of all of your friends, of all of your family, of the societal norms. So now fast forward 2000 years, and now we're talking about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now for some peculiar reason, we think that everything is going to be just as we suppose. When the first go around, it totally wasn't. <laughs> and in order to think that the second coming of Jesus Christ is going to follow some sort of ordinary script that you just read in you know, a, a gospel manual is it would break the pattern of the first coming. Indeed, Jesus Christ spent a lot of time sharing a very specific message with the Nephites when he came. And that message that he shared was all about his second coming and the dire straits that the world would find themselves in those days because things were not going to be normal. Indeed, he said that in that day that the Gentiles would begin to reject his gospel. And he provided a warning that, hey, if that happens, and if after these Gentiles, and he's referring to the Gentiles in the North American continent, after they have been blessed above all the people on the planet, because they've you know, inherited a land of promise, and with that land of promise, the blessings that come with a, a promised land, 
And if they then turn their back upon the God of Israel, who blessed this nation above all others, and go after the, the things of the world, well, Christ talked about that as the days of the Gentiles being fulfilled. And if you talks about this in Matthew uh, 24, it talks about this in Luke chapter 21, when Christ was on the uh, Mount of Olives with his 12 disciples, sharing with them things that were going to happen in the last days. And one of the things that he said would happen in the last days is that you know, when the uh, days of the Gentiles had come to the full, meaning they had ripened in iniquity and turned their backs upon the light and truth that they had received, then the days would come that men's hearts would fail them for fear and for the things that they saw coming upon the earth and that the very powers of heaven would be shaken. Now think about what you understand about the second coming of Jesus Christ. What is it that would cause men's hearts to fail because of the things that they see coming upon the earth? And why would those things that are coming upon the earth shake the very powers of heaven? Well, the key to understanding what that passage even means is in Third Nephi. It's in the Book of Mormon. It's in this special, special message that Jesus Christ told us that he was commanded by his Father to share with us. Now, when we study for the, the signs of the times and things like that for the Second Coming, hardly anybody turns to Third Nephi to understand what specifically Jesus Christ talked about with regards to the last days. And as a result, hardly anybody really has a clue about what is about to happen in this country specifically, and then overflowing to the rest of the world. Because we have a tendency as human beings to want to take things of a fantastic and supernatural nature and somehow relegate them to an allegorical kind of meaning. They somehow have to be symbolic. And we do this with all kinds of things today. For example, I mean, you go to BYU, uh, you're going to learn about evolution. You're not going to learn about creation. And why is that? Well, because the professors there believe that the creation was somehow allegorical. And that because of all of this other evidence, all of these range of different skulls and looks and different kinds of uh, body shapes and structures that uh, we have to have come from apes. And so, they discard and relegate all of the scriptures that talk about these things to some sort of symbolic realm. It's the same thing with the Great Flood. That had to have been some sort of allegory. It had to have been some regional event. It could not have been what the scriptures state that it indeed was. You go to Israel today, many people believe that the exodus of Egypt was figurative, that those were stories meant to instruct the house of Israel, but that they didn't really happen. And as you take that kind of thought process and project it upon some of the supernatural events that are prophesied that will happen in the last days, well, there's a tendency to normalize those events, to take the supernatural part out of it and 
when we do that, we begin to look at the scriptures in a totally different kind of way. And we, we place, you know, obstacles in our path to truly be able to understand. Because first and foremost, the Lord Jesus Christ and his Father, they are supernatural beings. The reality of things is that God the Father or his Son Jesus Christ, who are one in purpose and very similar in nature and personality and ability, they literally can command the elements and the elements will obey them. They did not need to use some sort of evolutionary process to create mankind. When Jesus Christ told the Jews, listen, my father could of these stones raise up posterity unto Abraham, he was not being allegorical. God the Father literally could do that. There is nothing that he cannot do. And we do ourselves a tremendous disservice when we put God into a box and we have to understand the scriptures from a perspective of Newtonian physics. When in reality, Newtonian physics explain the status quo as we presently understand it, but that the moment a being such as Jesus Christ steps onto the stage who can, at a word, say, damsel, arise, and the dead come to life, or Lazarus, come forth, or to the widow of Nain's son, or any manner of miracles, by his word alone, or sometimes not even that, just willing it to be so, like with you know, him changing water into wine. I mean, think about what that entailed. I mean, even, even if you just know a smidgen of you know, chemistry, you know that water is you know, one hydrogen molecule or atom and two oxygen um, uh, or H2O, yeah, so it's two hydrogens and one oxygen, uh, combined, right? Well, wine is a compound molecule that is very complex, right? <clears throat> so for H2O to become that compound molecule, you had to have protons and neutrons and electrons, you know, break bonds, and reorganize themselves instantaneously because of Christ's mental command to do so. So not, literally nothing is impossible. So now fast forward to some of these events that are prophesied in the scriptures that when you open up our manuals and you try to study these things from the perspective of, you know, the resources available, you know, on the church website, for instance. Well, you have to understand what is the objective of the church? Is the objective of the church to expound deep doctrines? Or is it milk before meat? If the church were on solid ground, if all of its members had strong and firm testimonies, then the leadership of the church, they could ratchet it up, you know, a notch, and we could, you know, start learning about things other than the very basics. But friends, 
all is not well in Zion. The church is not doing great. You look at the membership of the church as a whole. I mean, you have many people that have asked to have their names removed from the records of the church. And why? Because they can't or they disagree with the church's definition of the family. Something as basic as that. If, if members of the church have become so offended at the basic building block of humanity that they would leave the church over it, I guarantee you that we are not ready as an organization, as a body of the church, as a general group, to know what the words of Isaiah really mean. There's a reason when you look into the manuals of the church, come follow me, look at what the come follow me will teach you about the book of Daniel. Look at what Come Follow Me will teach you about the Isaiah chapters in the Book of Mormon. What will Come Follow Me teach you about Christ's message to the Nephites in 3rd Nephi? Pretty close to nothing. Now, why is that? Well, it's because, honestly, you cannot have a meaningful conversation about what those things mean without sounding like a conspiracy theorist. And so it is left to you and it's left to me to study these things out for ourselves. And that is in fact how the Lord intended this to be. It's how it was for the Jews when Christ came his first time individual Jewish families, families, in fact, people within the Jewish families had to each and every individual make a decision for themselves, whether they were going to follow Christ of Nazareth or whether they were going to follow the Jewish leaders. And it's very challenging. It's very difficult to go against the norm, against the what everybody else commonly believes. This is every bit as true for us in the church today as it was for the Jews back then. There is safety in what everybody else believes. But guess what? The doctrines that are being taught in Sunday schools and in seminaries and institute classes, um, they need to come from a certain, I mean, their objective is to create a firm foundation for you to then go and build upon yourself personally. Because ultimately, Learning these things is the purview of the Holy Ghost, and that is a very important aspect of the gospel. Many people seem to believe that only in theory. They believe that the Holy Ghost is there to testify to them that the Book of Mormon is true and that Joseph Smith was a prophet and to give them warnings about, you know, things that may be dangerous for them in their lives and to serve kind of as a severe weather warning, you know, alert in their lives, except for from a, a spiritual perspective. They do not believe that the Holy Ghost can teach you in the way that it taught Nephi, for example. But that is exactly what the Lord does expect for us to go and to knock and to seek as individuals. Jesus Christ commanded us to study certain things. And it's very interesting 
that the church's resources on those same things are nothing more than the very basics. Which means that if you want to understand these be beyond the surface level, then it's up to you. This is what Elder Bednar was talking about when he said, listen, don't think that the church is going to teach you everything that you need to know. That's your responsibility. You are responsible to learn the things that you must learn and know. And you are responsible for doing the things that you must do. That is not our responsibility. The church's responsibility is to make sure that the ordinances and uh, principles of the gospel are safeguarded and that they are available to all mankind. In fact, the scriptures are filled with passages where the Lord's servants are commanded to preach nothing save repentance to this generation. Well, then who is, how are we supposed to learn these things, you know, for ourselves? Well, if you look in Alma, I believe it's chapter 12, starting right around verse 9, you have Alma, who is coming on the hills of Amulek, explaining to a very hostile group of Nephites you know, about some things that they considered to be mysteries, impossible to know. And Alma says, listen, guys, it is given to many to know the mysteries of God. Just because you don't know these things does not mean that they are unknowable. Many people have been taught the mysteries of God and guess how they learned them. They learned them um, by studying the scriptures according to the heed and the diligence which they gave to the word. Now, there has been an interesting phenomenon with the rise of come follow me that the, the whole impetus for Come Follow Me was to get us into the scriptures more ourselves so that we could be taught by the Holy Ghost. And what have we done instead? Well, instead we go to YouTube to learn what somebody else has to say about Come Follow Me. And that's how we study it. We study these things vicariously. That is not the spirit of this program. It's great to go onto YouTube and listen to other people and get their thoughts and their opinions on it, but that does not take the place for you going and spending time in the scriptures and seeking answers for yourself. By outsourcing these things to other people, you put yourself in the same kind of jeopardy that the Jews put themselves in in Christ's first coming. I tell you that there are things that are so incredible in their very nature that if I were to talk to you plainly about them, you would laugh me to scorn. You would think that I'm crazy. And, you know, just by listening to those things, you would probably be justified, which is why Isaiah is written in the way that it the kind of language that it is written in. It's why John the Revelator wrote the way that he wrote. Because these things that are so incredible, if they were written in the kind of language that Nephi wrote in plainness, people just would not believe them. They'd, they'd throw the Bible away. So they're protected by this surface level encryption that if you truly want to understand and go beneath the surface, those scriptures will open unto you. But if you don't, if you're not really interested in paying the price, and guess what? There are very few people that are truly willing to pay the price. And as a result, there are very few people that have the foggiest idea of what the coming days are going to hold for us. But I'll tell you what, 
the people that did know these things, the prophets of old, they couldn't wait to see them in their fulfilled. They longed to be able to see them fulfilled. But at the same time, these same prophets were only permitted to discuss them in a certain way. And I think that this is very important for us to understand. Let's just take Nephi as an example. So Nephi has this phenomenal vision where he sees America, the Americas, from his day until the second coming of the Lord. And he gives kind of a blow by blow up until the last days after the pilgrims have you know, come to America and they brought with them the Bible and then the gospel was restored and there was a whore of Babylon, a great and abominable church that sought to dominate the globe. And in fact, as John the Revelator saw, did obtain dominion over the entire globe. And that organization, that whore of Babylon, which is not a single entity, it's a whole network of organizations. And any given organization may not even have the foggiest clue that it's part of the whore of Babylon. But according to what Nephi said, you know, the devil is the author of all of these. And he has, he began with the end in mind. And he knows what he is doing. And he is moving the chess pieces on the board masterfully. And Nephi saw these pieces come to where it was checkmate on the saints. And then he said, listen, I can't talk about this anymore. But you're going to know when these things are about to come to pass when you see the restoration of the house of Israel. And the Lord told me that other prophets wrote about these things. Isaiah was one of those prophets. And that John the Revelator would write about these things. And Nephi was prohibited to write any more except that he was permitted to transcribe some of Isaiah's chapters. And he transcribed about 19 of them. And every single one of those chapters has to do with the things that he saw transpire in America and across the globe in the last days. And they're meant to prepare us. Now, what do we do with that? There were, Nephi explains many of those uh, chapters. And in fact, in his commentary, sometimes he stops and says, listen, I can't say anything more. I was going to explain this beyond what I've done, but the Lord tells me, no, Nephi, you're not going to explain it beyond what you've done. I will teach these people myself if they will seek. If they will knock, you know, I will open unto them. If they seek, they shall find. But if they don't, then they won't. And they're just going to have to fly by the seat of their pants when these things are happening. Because most people aren't paying the price to understand these things. This is why our prophet has said, in a coming day, unless you have the constant guiding influence of the Holy Ghost, you simply will not survive. This is also why he has said that in the coming day, we will see the greatest miracles that Jesus Christ has ever performed. Why aren't we going to survive the coming day? And why will there be the greatest miracles the world has ever seen performed? Well, if you really are interested in understanding that, then the place for you to start is in 3rd Nephi. And you need to go beyond the simplistic messages in 3rd Nephi. You need, you know, the Sermon on the Mount is awesome. We all need to apply that in our lives 
and the Beatitudes, we need to become those things. But there is a part in 3rd Nephi that most people skip over. And it is probably the most relevant and most important to you in and our day than any other part in the entire Book of Mormon. In fact, Jesus Christ said, the Father commanded me to share this with you. And he began to expound this message to the Nephites in 3rd Nephi chapter 15, beginning in verse 10. And the message is about the restoration of the house of Israel in the last days. And he talked about three different bodies of Israel. Joseph, who's in America, who he ministered to at that time. The Jews who were in Jerusalem, whom he went to and ministered to in his day. And then the lost tribes of Israel, who at that time he also went and ministered to. He would have called 12 disciples amongst them, just as he called 12 disciples amongst Joseph, and just as he called 12 apostles amongst Judah. He goes on to start explaining about the importance and the ramification of the lost tribes of Israel and the significance that the restoration of the lost tribes of Israel will have for the Gentiles in the last days. He says that when the Gentiles reject the gospel, that a remnant of Jacob, and by remnant of Jacob, we should understand that this is a body, this is a portion of the lost tribes of Israel that precedes the main group, will come to North America and will purge this country. It will purge it of all wickedness. And if we have rejected Jesus Christ and the covenants of this promised land, we will be wiped off of the face of the earth just like every other nation that has ever occupied these lands was. And then, you know, you get to 3 Nephi 17 and he stops. And he says, listen guys, I've been here all day. I know that you're tired and you are not understanding the message that the Father has commanded me to give you. Notice he did not say that about the Beatitudes. He said it about this part, the part of the message that every member of the church skips over. This is the part that Christ says, go home, pray to the Father, that he will help you to understand my words. And I will come back tomorrow and we'll revisit this. We'll talk about it some more. But in the meantime, I am going to go and visit the lost tribes of Israel, for they are not lost unto the Father, for he knoweth whither he hath taken them. Friends, I cannot believe how blind we are as a church to these things. It is inexcusable for us to have had the Book of Mormon for close to 200 years and to be so completely ignorant with regards to this cornerstone message within its pages. But we are. Now, in 3 Nephi chapter 20, Christ comes back. And in about the 10th verse of that chapter, he says, now listen, remember, yesterday I was sharing a message that my father commanded me to share with you. And you guys, your eyes were rolling back in your heads and so I had to stop. Now we're gonna pick that up and I'm gonna finish the commandment which my father gave me. Guys, that should make the hair on the back of your necks stand straight up. Why did the father command his son Jesus Christ to share that message with us? And why do you skip over it? If you will take the time to, I mean, we talk about 
pronouns today in the most ridiculous manner. But if you take you know, third Nephi, this message that I'm talking about in third Nephi, and you map out all of those pronouns, that will actually be a, a very beneficial exercise for you because it will force you to put a body of people with each of those pronouns. And you will begin to understand that when Christ is giving that message, He's not just speaking to Joseph. At the very beginning, in 3 Nephi chapter 15, verse 10, he says, listen, you guys are a remnant of Joseph. And then he talks about the Jews, and then he talks about the lost tribes of Israel. And then in the uh, when we start getting into chapter uh, 20 of 3 Nephi, Instead of referring to the lost tribes of Israel as the lost tribes, he refers to them as a remnant of Jacob because it is this forerunner group from the main body of the lost tribes of Israel who by this time has grown to numbers that will stagger our, you know, we, we will not be able to believe it. I mean, these folks are in the billions by now. Just, just think of how many people are in the United States right now. When 200 years ago, uh, uh, coming across the Mayflower and, and the first, you know, several waves of colonists, I mean, you had a couple thousand pilgrims and now we have 320, 330 million people on this um, in this country, what would happen in, amongst the lost tribes of Israel who, according to the scriptures, were taken captive into Assyria as a body in 720 BC, and then they left Assyria when Assyria fell because Babylon came and conquered Assyria, and then they made a covenant with the Lord and said, God, we never kept the commandments and statutes when we were in our own land. If you will guide us to a new land, we will covenant with you that we will keep these covenants and promises from now on. And then the scriptures say that they went to the north, to a land where never before man hath dwelt, which is called Asareth. And there they remained until the latter days. We have no idea where Asareth is. What we do know is that in Doctrine and Covenants section 133, beginning in verse 26, it says that they of the North Country will return when their prophets no longer stay themselves. And that when they come, their enemies, meaning the enemies of the house of Israel, will become a prey to them. Now, in the message in the Book of Mormon, where Jesus Christ is, is talking, he's really talking to us. That message is for us. The Nephites, guess what? They never even had the Book of Mormon. Mormon compiled that book for the Gentiles, for us in the last days. So when Christ was talking to them, Really, he was giving a message to us. The message from the Father is to us. And so Christ is telling us, says, listen, Gentiles, if you reject everything, if you turn your back on the foundational principles upon which this, count, this country was founded on, which your forefathers bled out their lives to preserve, if you turn your back on that in exchange for the philosophies of men mingled with scripture, well then a remnant of Jacob will come amongst you as a lion and will exercise vengeance and fury upon you such as you have not heard. And your cities will become desolate and all of your chariots will be destroyed. 
referring to everything that you have will be taken from you and your land of promise will be given to a people worthy of it. And he says that the remnant of Jacob will inherit these lands. Now these lands were given to Joseph, but guess what? Joseph, many of Joseph are going to reject the gospel and have already rejected it. Joseph isn't just the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Joseph is by and large the vast majority of people upon this continent, north and south. It's because the Lord gathered Joseph here. He's able to do his own work. When, just look this up, uh, go to Federal Hall, the, the website for Federal Hall, and look at the Bible that George Washington laid his hand on. He laid his hand on the passage in the book of Genesis. I believe it's Genesis 48. His hand was on 48, 49. But in 48, that's where it says, Joseph is a fruitful bough that groweth over the wall. And, his, um, and the archers hated him and you know, fought against him. But the hand of the Lord was with him and preserved him. It's talking about the formation of America, upon which George Washington, by the grace of God, was able to birth this country. And now it is no coincidence that his hand is upon this verse as he is being sworn in as the nation's first president. But now we're turning our backs on everything. We're turning our backs on the four foremost tenets of society. We're redefining what a family is. And, you know, forget about all of this nonsense, um, this new fandangled philosophy, and just say, if everybody did this, what happens to the world in a single generation? If we, if we redefined the family, and if everybody did that, in a single generation, there are no more children. Society ends. I mean, it's so simple when you look at it from that perspective. If everybody were murderers, society would end. Um, but now things are so complicated and, um, I mean, Satan has such tremendous hold upon our society that people get so angry their hearts are filled with rage when you talk about core values i remember when christ was speaking to a large group of people people started to get up and leave because they were offended by what he was saying you look at the world today so many people are offended by what christ has said now that they're leaving and they're going, they're walking towards a new and woke and enlightened philosophy that is twisted lies. Jeremiah says that the youth in that day, when the light bulb finally turns on, will say, our fathers have inherited lies. That is true. You know, lies are being taught to these, ri these rising generations, and they're swallowing hook, line, and sinker. And because of this, you know, people are falling away in mass. This is every denomination across the board. People are turning away from Jesus Christ and the gospel. And as a result, you know, the things that Christ spoke about in Third Nephi will happen. Christ commanded us to study those things. 
he commanded us to study the words of the prophets. And by the words of the prophets, he was referring to the Old Testament prophets that prophesied specifically pertaining to the restoration of the house of Israel. That's Jeremiah, that's Ezekiel, that is Isaiah, that's Daniel, uh, and it's John the Revelator. I mean, the prophets who lived at the time that Israel was scattered in the first place are the same prophets that wrote about its prophetic restoration in the last days. Those were the prophets that Christ commanded us to study. Those are the prophets that when you look in the manuals of the church will give you just the slightest inkling of what those things are even about. If you want to understand those things, you need to understand them from the perspective of the restoration of the house of Israel in the last days. Outside of that, it makes no sense. But when you understand that all 19 of the Isaiah chapters in the Book of Mormon talk about that specifically, with the exception of when Abinadi quotes Isaiah, and he's quoting you know, Isaiah because it's talking about the suffering servant, Jesus Christ, who will come. All of the other Isaiah chapters are talking about the restoration of the house of Israel and how that will impact us in the last days. This is the biggest gift for us to truly be able to prepare ourselves for what is going to happen in the last days. And so few of us understand it or have even tried to understand it. So, I mean, there are ways, the, the, the way, how did I understand? I, I, I have never taken any classes on ancient scripture. I've never taken any classes on language. I've never, you know, taken anything studied anything, you know, in school that would qualify me to understand any of this. You know how I understood it? Is I studied first the Father's message to Jesus Christ in 3 Nephi. That is where it all clicked and fell into place. Once I understood what and who he was talking about, then I went back to the Isaiah chapters in the Book of Mormon, and they made sense to me. But if, I mean, that's, it's, Christ is giving you the little orphan Annie decoder pin in Third Nephi. But you need to, to use it. You need to not watch a YouTube on those videos. This isn't enough. What I'm saying to you right now, it's not enough. You have to go and study this and as you do, the Spirit will speak to you and you will learn. If you don't understand something, if you're reading a passage and you go, what in the heck does that mean? I don't understand. Ponder about it. Think about it. Write about it. As you do those things, as you make an effort, the Lord will begin to fill in the blanks for you. You don't need me to tell you these things. You don't need anybody to explain these things other than the Holy Ghost and the tools that the Lord gave you to be able to understand. You know, now I have written uh, books that are my insights. It's the gospel according to Michael Rush. Um, and you know, you're, you're, you're welcome to uh, use those as resources, but you've got to understand that those are second best Good, better, best. The best is to learn from the Holy Ghost. And maybe you need a crutch to get going, but you need to learn to walk without the crutch. And so it would be my hope that, you know, if you need a little help, I mean, my book, Delight in Plainness, that goes verse by verse through all of the Isaiah chapters in the Book of Mormon. Um, and you can, you can listen to A Remnant Shall Return anywhere there are podcasts. You can listen to it for free. Um, that gives an excellent overview of what the covenants that the Father has made uh, with Israel and how those covenants will be 
fulfilled in the last days. Because if your focus is on signs and wonders, um, particularly those commonly understood, earthquakes in diverse places, waves heaving beyond their bounds, you know, wars and rumors of wars, uh, the hearts of men turning cold, uh, those kinds of things. Yeah, that that's a thermometer. It tells you, yeah, it's getting hot outside. But it doesn't prepare you for what's about to happen. It only tells you, guess what? Whatever's about to happen is going to start happening now. If you want to understand what's about to happen on the earth, you need to start there. But I'll tell you that what's about to happen pertains to just a handful of things. Any one of which I were to go into very much detail, you would think I was crazy. You would think that I was a conspiracy theorist. You would discount me and just turn me off. That's why it is important for you to go and pay the price to understand these things. The things that Christ talked about to the Jews were revolutionary. If you were used to hearing the same things for thousands of years and then someone coming into your village begins to do incredible miracles and starts teaching you things that are very different from what you had considered. And then that man is killed and you have to go, hmm, some people say that he rose again, but the Jews, the leaders are saying that, uh, you know, his apostles just paid off the guards and that it's all a lie. Um, I mean, you can see how easy it would have been, and indeed it was, for the run-of-the-mill Jew to take the resurrection of Jesus Christ and interpret it as being some crazy conspiracy theory. Really? Angels came down from heaven and rolled away the stone and none of the Roman soldiers, you know, come forward to talk about it seriously. You believe that? Um, it sounds crazy. It takes more effort to believe that um, than to just go along with the ordinary narrative. Friends, it is no different today. It will take more of you, demand more of you. You have to pay a price. Any convert who has ever joined the gospel, the restored uh, gospel of Jesus Christ, had to first be willing to go against the grain, do something that brought ridic ridicule upon him. The Father seems to have designed it this way. He doesn't make it easy. And when it comes to the events of the last days, it is the same. The things that are about to happen upon this planet are shocking. You would not believe them. You know, I had actually recorded a separate, uh, a different keynote talk where I talked about these things very openly, my opinions on them. And then at the end of it, I said, you know what? No, I'm not going to do that. Um, I just, I just simply can't talk about it uh, openly. Um, it's, it, it's, it's too much for, for people that have not paid the price to understand, and it actually does more harm than it does good. So all I can do is point to these messages and say they're there. Go and look for them. Pay the price to understand these things, and you will understand them. But 
I will say that if you don't understand that there will be not only the gathering of Israel that has been ongoing since the restoration of the church, but there will be, as the 10th article of faith says, a literal restoration of the lost 10 tribes and that that restoration will rival the exodus of Egypt in its wonder and awe. If you don't understand that, then you don't understand anything about what's about to transpire on the earth. I, I say that with absolute sincerity and confidence. The second thing, when John the Revelator spoke of a whore of Babylon that would infiltrate all corners of the globe and enrich the elite across the globe, that's real. That is not a conspiracy theory. The whore of Babylon is the same thing as the great abominable church that Nephi spoke of. In fact, Nephi used the whore upon many waters and the great abominable church synonymously, interchangeably. That is the same thing as the whore of Babylon. It is also the same thing as secret combinations. The whore of Babylon rose to power as a result of secret combinations. They exist. We talk about them today, you know, using different nomenclature, the deep state, for instance. But why these things sound like conspiracy theories? So did the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because something sounds crazy does not mean that it is. There are too many prophecies that talk about the incredible power that the whore of Babylon will wield in the last days. And just look at society. The messaging that is going on today is coordinated. This isn't a random grassroots movement. It is socially engineered and being pushed upon us. And it's being orchestrated by the whore of Babylon. So the whore of Babylon is plays a major role in the events of the last days. And the Whore of Babylon has never had the kind of power that it does today. The third thing that you really need to understand is that the prophecies with regards to false prophets and antichrists in the last days are literal. They are not figurative. There will be an Antichrist that has such incredible power that he will appear to be God. He will do things that will cause the vast majority of people on this planet to believe that God has returned. Even faithful disciples of Jesus Christ will be deceived. This man will be able to do things that up until this point, only God has been able to do. I mean, some of these miracles are so impressive that it boggles the mind. The book of Revelation speaks of this man giving life to inanimate objects. Think of it in terms of you know, the priests of Pharaoh who were able to transform uh, staffs into living serpents. It's that kind of power, but on a much broader scale. You, if you do not have this man on your radar, you will be deceived by him. This is why you will not survive the coming day. Most people are not going to ever have this man on their radar because they didn't pay the price, because this sounded too crazy. This was a conspiracy theory. So they, the vast majority of people are going to have to wing it. 
They're going to have to decide in the moment what they believe, which is why if you do not have the constant guiding influence of the Holy Ghost, you will not survive it. Even the very elect, according to the covenant, will be deceived. Christ said, if it were possible, and it is possible. <clears throat> so those, those are, you know, a couple of things that, you know, are, are very, very important. That if you don't understand those three things, you don't understand what's about to happen. How could you possibly understand? You may have created some elaborate time frame, timeline, but you have no idea. You simply do not know what you don't know. But you have the tools to be able to understand those. And your best resources are the scriptures themselves, the source documents. If at all possible, go and drink the water from the original fountain. Don't go drink it from the pasture after all the cows have walked in it. And I'm one of the cows. You need to go to the source. Seek to be guided by the Holy Ghost. Take responsibility for your spiritual education. Be aggressive in your learning. Be voracious. Take advantage of the Book of Mormon. The Lord said that the entire church is under condemnation for taking that book lightly. And Ezra Dot Benson said, we remain under that condemnation today because nothing's changed. The vast majority of the church has no idea of this central core message. The consistent thing in the Book of Mormon is when prophets begin to talk about this, the Lord stops them says, don't go beyond this point. This is a test. I'm trying the faith of my people. He did that with Nephi. He did that with Mormon. He did that with Moroni. Of course, we don't have the writings of Jared, but I guarantee you that they talk about these things and that this is the number one reason that we don't have those records because we're not utilizing what we have. And honestly, nobody would believe it anyway because it would sound too much like a gigantic conspiracy theory. So friends, I think I've you know, expressed what I hoped to talk about today. Um, I hope that you will have the desire to take the next step yourself to study these things. My advice to you is to begin in 3rd Nephi. Make that those passages be as familiar with those as you are with your own image in the mirror. And if you do that, then you will be prepared for what's coming. It will help you to unlock everything else. I promise you that. Because that's what's happened for me. That's how I came to understand the things that I understand. We need to step it up. You know, the hour is close. The fur is already starting to fly. It's, it's getting bad and it's about to get much worse. We need to learn these things so that we can help others when, you know, they begin to question their own faith because they will, you will. These things will be that dramatic, that different. I mean, Paul said that the Antichrist will seek to change time and laws. He will turn everything you think you know upside down. I'm. I'm currently in the process of writing um, a commentary on the Book of Enoch. And, you know, I, I think I may wait until 
um, I retire to to publish it because there's no way I could get a job after I publish this thing because I mean it's it's too out there. But I believe every word of it. Well, friends, um, I hope that uh, that this has been beneficial to you. Know that you live in a supernatural world. Know that Newtonian physics is not the norm. It is the exception. And that the rule is whatever God says goes. And we have an opportunity to become like him if we will follow his son and do the things that he asked us to do. And one of the things that he asked us to do was to study this message. So we better get with the program and we better study it. All right, friends, until next time, God bless.